Okay. Go ahead. Then I hit continue. Hi, welcome to the ECP new parent orientation. We are actually waiting for the director to come on. She should be with us shortly. Um, I'm guessing with the weather, she got stuck in traffic. Okay, while well, we're waiting for Mrs. Mel to join us, you want to start with the first slide, Laser, and see. Okay, so let's start with who's on. I'm the assistant social caseworker, Zebra Dions, and we have our nurse Chavez with us. She's going to be our ECP nurse. And then we have two teachers with us. Guys, you wanna introduce yourselves? Hello, my name is Janine Woodbury and I'm one of the teachers at the Early Childhood Program. I had trouble muting there. Uh, I'm Alex Pendolfi and I'm uh, the other teacher uh, that is here tonight uh, for the Early Childhood Program. So why don't we have the teachers go ahead and start with the goals of pre-K until uh, Mrs. Mel joins us. Okay, sure. So the goals of our program, the early childhood program are to provide a rich child-centered, literacy-focused learning environment. We also ensure that all of the children are kindergarten ready and um, we offer experiences that ensure children's learning of the academic, personal, and interpersonal skills essential to school success, such as their being able to share, um, forming friendships with their friends, and um, many other skills, just to make sure that they are all kindergarten ready. So our program offers an academic curriculum with certified teachers and to make sure that everything is running smoothly, we make sure there's parent involvement and commitment to our program. Parents can be involved by being a classroom parent. Um, you can be involved by supplying us with many different types of, um, just different things to help us throughout the day. If we need tissues, you can help us with tissues. If you have a snack that you would like for all the class to have, um, in the snacks for the class. So we just make sure to keep a uh, running communication between the teachers and the parents to make sure that we are all committed to the students' learning. Um, currently, pre k is offered in a variety of excuse me, settings. We have mainstream classes, inclusion classrooms, as well as special education classrooms. Is this slide still for us, Mrs. Dionne? Um, I'll take, I could do this slide. Okay. Um, but I'm getting a text, I just want to make sure. Oh, Dawn, is Dawn yes, on? I'm, yes, I'm here. Finally, it took me a second and I so apologize to every, every single one of my, our parents for September, 2021. I deeply apologize. I would like to, I'm Dawn Mermail. I am the director of the Early Childhood Program. Um, we've uh, planned this whole uh, presentation for you. Please, if you have any questions, put your questions in the chat um, and we will review any questions you have. I would like to thank my two teachers who are present, um, Janine Woodbury and Mr. Uh, Alex Pendolfi. 
Um, I would like to thank both of you for being here and sharing your experience with our families in the classroom and what takes place and what it is that we do as educators to make a difference in the young lives of our little people. We are the foundation of this district. We are pre-K to 12 district. So with that said, um, highly experienced teachers, both have their master's degree certified by the state of New York. Um, so parents, um, please feel free, throw questions in the chat. Um, and so that this way we can make sure we answer your questions. So uh, what would you like me to do, Deb? Okay, go ahead. You can start with um, the first days of school. How are we going to okay, start off? It. Okay. I would like to think of, listen, families, first of all, we do this as a team. Yes, I am the administrator, but we do this as a professional family. So I do at times as a leader, learn how to follow and will work with my team. So for the first day of school, the pre-kindergarten program begins with September. Um, only for those families who are Head Start families, you will receive a uh, call, email from your child's teacher, letting you know that we do home visits. Now, we haven't done home visits in the past, what, year or so, um, due to the pandemic and the many challenges we were, we've been faced with. Uh, however, we did do them remote. So we learned other creative ways to handle how we do what we do to make it best, better for you. So with that said, school will start. Our special needs students, because of the county, um, because of uh, their, their needs, uh, they start on September 9th. Um, we will start our home, start home visit September 9th and 10th. Our, uh, the rest of our students, um, UPK and Head Start students, will start on September 13th, um, which will allow us, you think, oh, well, why so far, far down? It's not that far. Um, when we start on the 9th, we have 9th and 10th, then we have the weekend, and then we start fresh that Monday. So with that said, um, we will have a bus orientation. I'm looking forward to this, us going back to some sort of a normalcy. Um, instead of doing the bus orientation via Google Zoom, um, and having um, our supervisor transportation to be present. We will uh, be doing it, hopefully, God willing, with um, everyone being vaccinated and moving forward in a normal way. Hopefully, we'll be back to doing it where we can put the children on the bus. We will explain everything to you on that day. Um, and what it is, a lot of our children very young, never rode the bus, maybe a public school bus, but to get on that school bus and to leave you is a challenging experience for our little people. Um, but we do want them to experience it. And if they're having any sort of difficulty, they will not experience it alone. They will experience with, with maybe an adult, whomever came with them. If two adults want to be ride with them, but we do give them a ride um, on the bus just to give them that experience. Hopefully this upcoming school year, God willing, we will be able to um, do trips. So the children will be involved in trips. We always do all of our trips connected to the curriculum. Every trip have a purpose, place and meaning. So with that, um, we make sure that all the connections, whether the children have prior experiences, no experiences, we make sure that they have that experience. Now, many of you will say, I'm going to right now bring my child to school. That's fine, but I'll tell you this, and Ms. Woodbury and Mr. Pendolfi can vouch for this, and so can Ms. Dionne's. When the children start to make friends in the classroom and they start riding that bus and they're getting picked up by you and they want to ride with their friends, they're going to say, um, I want to take the bus. And when that happens, that means your child is ready to show that independence. Your child is ready to take that leap of faith and travel that bus on their own. So um, that's why we have the bus orientation to give them that experience to ride the bus without you <laughs> um, and with their peers. But there will be uh, faculty and staff on the bus to support our children and to provide them any support as well. So next slide. 
I can't believe that rain out there. That rain was crazy coming that's, home. <laughs> that's for me doing the next this slide. Okie dokie. Our attendants, yes, our nurse, Chris, Crystal Chavez. Let me give you a little bit about our nurse, um, Mrs. Uh, Chavez, Nurse Crystal, as the children will be calling her. Um, she comes to us as a, as a parent with children in the school district. Um, she uh, was phenomenal, um, got her degree in nursing. She has a bachelor's of science in nursing. Um, our nurse, Nurse Nancy, uh, retired after, what is it, like 13, 14 years, Deb, something yes, like that? I got yeah, that about 13 years. Um, so we have Nurse uh, Crystal, and I got to give it to her. Yeah, about that. I got to give it to Nurse Crystal. Um, though she may be new as an employee to the district, She's not new to her job and responsibilities as a medical professional. She's a constant everyday learner. Um, she's involved in weekly uh, um, nurse meetings with our assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction and personnel, uh, Dr. Uh, Corey Remis. Currently right now, we are housed in Highview School where nurse uh, uh, Crystal, she shares an office with the Highview nurse. So with that said, I will step back and let you have it, um, Nurse Crystal. Um, Hi, Miss Mail. Hi, Miss Mail. Who said that, you little weasels? Hey, you're in the picture. Okay, that's you in the picture. Me, uh, that's me in the picture. Oh, let me click and find my, oh, I love finding my, there you are. I love it. Hi, honeys. How are you? Good. <laughs> Good. See, see, see that? Then you know that there's love. See, <laughs> when you make that difference in the life of the children. So, hi, honey. I'm going to turn it over to Nurse Crystal, but mwah, to you. Okay, Nurse Crystal, it's yours, my darling. Thanks, Miss. Thanks, Miss Mail. Okay, so um, our attendance school hours are from 9:15 to 3:45. Um, it is very important that uh, the children attend regularly every day. Uh, if they are to be absent or late, please email me. My email me, my email is there with the child's name in the subject line. And then the reason for the child being absent. If they're late, same thing, just let, shoot us an email. Let us know that um, the child's gonna be late. <clears throat> if you can't get to the email, Please call me if I don't answer, leave me a message. Also, um, to go to school, illness or sickness symptom free for 24 hours without medication is the base, but with, with um, COVID, things are different, very different. As of right now, you know, we have not heard any changes um, with the toolkit for attending school during COVID, during illnesses. We take it very seriously that any one symptom, and this is, a, we follow the Department of Health and we actually go above the Department of Health a little bit. The district itself goes above the Department of Health. But the base of the Department of Health is any one symptom of illness, the child cannot come to school unless we know that that symptom is not due to COVID. We're not saying you have to get to COVID tested when we do ask for you, even if it's the sniffles, even if it's just a cough, it was a fever for one, like one time fever the day before. Don't send your child in, they're gonna go back home and then I'm, I'm gonna ask you to take them to the doctor. So just <laughs> avoid that, take them to the doctor they'll tell you, well, okay, we, we need to get a COVID test because they, this may be COVID or it's strep throat or this is due to allergies or this is a stomach um, food virus poisoning, or for example. Not even, a, uh, not even a stomach virus. We can't take stomach viruses as nope. diagnosis anymore and we can't take your common cold. 
or just like a upper respiratory infection. They have to give us COVID or an alternate diagnosis, except for those three. Ms. Nurse Crystal, I just want you to hold that one for a second. Yes. I want to share with the families, and I want to share this because we we work so close together and to keep the parents in the loop. What's happening is we've had parents to get upset with us to say, okay, you know what? I told you my child has allergies. Let me share this with you. I have all year round allergies, okay? I developed them about... I don't want to tell my age, but I developed this some years ago. And what happens is, is that anytime you have symptoms, and that's why we have the easy screen, the symptoms that they put on the easy screen, diarrhea, a persistent cough, a vomiting fever, sore throat. These are things that can be, that can be um, your typical uh, uh cold or maybe they ate something and their stomach wasn't right or you know it could be something so small and minute but we have to take the necessary precautions by the cdc and doh department of health um because we cannot take any chances so once you get your child cleared that your child has an allergy or that your child has this or that maybe your child is still teething and might have some, some issues in that area, whatever. Once we get your child cleared with that, what happens is we now know, so when they exhibit that, those symptoms, uh, Nurse Crystal will know, okay, you know what, this is what the pet we have from the doctor, this is what we know, but we have to clear them of that. I had to get a do medical documentation to say for myself, when I went through my things, um, and I had to prove it for myself. So we're just asking for our families to. We lost you there, Miss Mail. We lost, we can't hear you. Miss Mail, you're muted. It, no, it, like she, I think her, her service left her went. All right, so I'm just gonna fill in what she was trying and to say because we, oh, there yeah, she we, is. We had a lot of, we had a lot of parents very upset with us, but in explaining everything to them, asking them to calm down, but that this, this is our new normal, you know, parents did calm down. So we're just asking, we hopefully, they're saying that they're going to open back New York state. Hopefully every people, folks will get vaccinated. <clears throat> Whatever the case may be, we're looking for September to hopefully be from what we're hearing through the news and everything um, to be where, you know, maybe we could go back to normal things. However, we still gotta say that's the world of the unknown right now for us. So we have to err on the side of caution and we have to say, okay, we have to follow these rules, whether we like them or we don't, because this is what we're told to do by the state of New York. Um, that's where we get our state funding. So we're just asking for you to bear with us get what we need for medical documentation, support Nurse Crystal, and keep everyone safe and um, healthy. Thank you. Thank you, yes, exactly. So if your child does have seasonal allergies, this season was terrible. Um, I just need that documented by a doctor on their physical or somewhere that says they have allergies. These are the symptoms of their allergies. And then we can take it from there. So just bear with us, like Ms. Mills said, Someone asked if we're wearing masks. As of right now, yes, the children are wearing masks. There is no mandate that said that we are not, to, we don't have to. Again, the district and the Department of Health were separate entity, right? So we can go, we can, for example, right now uh, for the Department of Health, you can travel anywhere in the world and or anywhere in the country. You don't need a COVID test to return back to New York, right? But for the for Greenbrook Central Seven, I'm sorry, for Greenbrook Central School District, I just dated myself. Um, you do need a COVID test four days after you return from a different state, a non-contingent um, state. People wouldn't know that because the Department of Health says you don't need a a COVID test or quarantine. Greenberg is allowed to say yes, we do require you a, a COVID test from you know day four after coming back from Florida. So that's just an example. Um, another example is 
when you are in contact with somebody with COVID, when you're at first contact, the Department of Health said you only need to be quarantined for 10 days. The Greenberg Central School District says you are not allowed to come back to school for 14 days. So we are allowed to tweak it a little bit to get a, be a little bit more stricter. We just can't go under the base. So Department of Health rules are the base rules. We can go and be a little bit more um, strict on those rules. We just can't go under. So I just want to have, you know, make that clear with everybody. Uh, again, I don't know what September is going to look like. Will we go maskless by then? We don't know, but we'll, we'll let you know. Um, where can you find a list of contingent states based on Greenberg's requirements? On the Greenberg website, on Greenberg's, uh, Greenberg's SD dot csd.org you can find uh, basically it's new york new jersey oh contingent states is anywhere but anywhere. new york new jersey connecticut pennsylvania massachusetts and vermont those are the non-contingent states every other state after that is a con you know you it's a non-contingent state um so that's that also i want to remind anybody if uh during our registration meeting that we had with, with all of you. Um, I gave you a list of, I, some of you, I gave you a list of things that your physic, your child's physical is still missing. If you have not gotten that to me, please do so ASAP. My last day of school is June 22nd and I will not, I will not return to the last week of August. So your child will not be able to be cleared until I come back. I will occasionally check my emails during the summer, but I'm not gonna live on my emails over the summer. So if everybody can get to me everything I told you, if I if you if you owe me anything before June 22nd, please do so so that your child can be cleared before I leave. Some of you don't have physicals till July, August. I know which ones those are, and those are the ones I'll be reviewing yeah. over the summer. Thank you very much. I would like to to piggyback on that and say, um, during the summer, we do we are going to have a, a nurse for the summer because we are having a summer program for our children with special needs. The county says so. Uh, so we are going to have someone available um, to work with us. <clears throat> um, I will be there. I'm fully aware of what the requirements and everything are. So what's going to happen is um, get that paperwork in. If we know that yearly you have your child gets a physical and this is time, we have it documented. You will not be held like accountable if your child does not have a physical up front when Nurse Chavez, uh, Nurse Crystal leave. But if your child is not due, say for example, they're not due for a physical until October, what do you do? We're going to take your child in pending that you have an appointment. The key thing is at our level, see, there's different points. See, if you go to the state website, you'll see um, what the requirements are. There's no secrets in terms of what your child needs. You're going to know by grade level if they need their physical done every year or every two years. I don't think it's every year. In the beginning, I know it's like every year, but then after that, I think it's every year. So you need to, but in terms of ECP, we're the entry into the district. You need their physical. We need that documentation. But one thing I can say, we will work with our families. Again, if your child's physical is not due until after school start, as long as you have an appointment, your child will start school with no problem. And that's a promise. Next. Okay, that would be, that would be my slide. But, yep, this, <laughs> but there are two questions sitting out there. Um, okay. Can waitlisted children fill out the form for the physical? If so, where is it available? That's a good one. The, the, isn't the form available on our website? I don't think the medical. Yes, it's there. It's greenbergcsd.org. You go under the health section under departments. Then there's a health. And on the health section is all the 
medical forms that you would need dental, the physical, um, if the child takes medication and you need to send also, oh, that's another thing. If your child needs medication at school, please go into the website, download that paper, have a doctor fill that out, you fill that out. And then the first day of school, please bring those forms with the medication itself. So don't send it in the book bag. I need an adult to give it to another adult, the medication. So everything is on greenbergcsd.org. And the medication can be, the medication, since the uh, school is not going to start, aside from our special needs children, is not going to start until the 13th. Parents, you can, and you can have it where as long as you have that document filled out, the medication, a family member, someone can bring it to the school, they can drop it off. Because we do know everybody works. Um, I've always been a working parent. But you should utilize your resources, utilize family members, utilize those who, um, who might be off that day. But we can take the medication in as long as we have that documentation before the kids start school. So if you know your child has, can't say that word, but whatever it is that they need, you just make sure we have that medication. Some children, I do know with sunscreen, um, and they say, oh, but there's no prescription. No, there's not a prescription for the sunscreen, but we need your doctor to give us permission, okay, that your child needs it applied how often. Some children are very fair skin. Their skin can be at jeopardy, okay? We don't want that. So we want to make sure that we do what we need to do to support your child and make sure that your child has a healthy, comfortable, fun, fantastic academic year. Okay, so you can get the medicine to us early and just go to the website. We truly appreciate that. Thank Dawn, you. Dawn, Dawn, there's another question out there for you. Is is there an is there an open house to visit the facility for parents? There used to be. <laughs> there used to be. Um, um, hopefully, if we get back to some sort of normalcy, um, that we can let folks into the building. I do know that the main building, and I'm going to put it out there because part of ECP is housed at Highview right now because the ECP main building um, doesn't have outside ventilation. Um, we have five classrooms housed at Lee F. Jackson because the mansion building is not equipped. Um, to house our children where they've been housed there for years, about 60, it's over 60 years ECP, a Greenberg Central School District has been a, a pre-K to 12 district. So we are in two spots. We're good with that. No matter where my teachers are, no matter where we are as educators, we're gonna handle our business and make sure that we keep up on our professional development. We keep up on the current trends in, in edu early childhood education. We make sure that we articulate, not just amongst ourselves, and that's done weekly, weekly, right? Uh, Ms. Wood Woodbury and Mr. Pendolfi, weekly. They have weekly meetings where we go over, they go over millions of things um, for our children. We look to see what's working, what's not working. So, um, yes. We will, you know, we will do what we need to do in terms of that piece. Um, I hope I answered the question. And then uh, the next slide is, um, like Nurse Travis said, we did most of, no, go back one, laser. Yeah. Uh, when we did the registrations, if anything has changed, I need you to notify me. My email address is up there. If you changed your address, if you changed your email or the phone numbers, that's very important because we need to get to we need to get to the parents quick if there's an emergency. And then we also have a, we also have a parent handbook, so we're going to make sure if you don't you don't get the email um, ad addresses up here. If you go to the district website, you can find us. We're public employees. We are findable, right? So you can find us. So we're going to make sure you get a handbook so that this way, um, when in doubt, um, and if you're not sure if you, you sent something to um, Mrs. Dion's, 
Um, and if you want to, if you're a parent and you say, listen, I just want to let another person know, you can let me know, you can let Nurse Chavez, we all work together, okay? So whatever it is that we need um, to support you as parents, giving us your little person, I love the little people, giving us your little person, we're going to do what we need to do. Exactly. And, and I have a lot of I have a lot of returning parents and they know my promise. I've been in the district 20 years and I've never made a promise. If I can't keep it, I would not give it. I've never gave a promise or gave my word on something. If I say, I'll try, I'll research it. You know what? Let's do this together because it might be um, waters that we're treading together that are a little more newer or whatever the case may be. We will do it together. You will never be alone. I want parents to know that. Children are very young. We got to make sure that we we secure you to secure our little people. Okay, so, and then uh, after then after you send me um, the change that you want, I will then send it to the district, and the district will update it on their um, on their computers. In August, we're going to send out a package. We don't know whether it's going to be by um, regular mail or by email. Yes. And that's going to have our ECP handbook yes. and your child's classroom yes. assignment. Yes. And uh, for those that don't know, like Mrs. Mail said, we're housed in two different locations. At the ECP main building, we're going to have four classrooms. And at the LFJ building, we will have five classrooms. Uh, next slide, Lisa. But it doesn't matter where we are. Okay. Um, and then there are there are students that are being brought in by their parents. Um, each building has a little bit different type of rules. Excuse I me, know, I'm just going to step away. I'll be back. Okay. I know at the ECP main building, you have to come through the front entrance where we're located at and um, you have to sign we'll check to make sure that the person picking up the child is on the emergency list we will give that parent a slip of paper allowing them to pick up the child and then they will go to the back where we dismiss the children from um, mr pandarfi how do you do it over at the lee f jackson building they have a little bit different rules um, I mean, they go through the main, um, they go through the main entrance at Lee F. Jackson, um, but they also do come in and out of, we kind of have like a, if you go to the front of Lee F. Jackson, there's basically a, the main entrance is the double doors to your right as you're looking at the building. And there are also two double doors on the left, but it depends if Mr. Romaine is there or not. But I think Mr. Romaine would probably be going back to the main building next year now. I, I believe so. I mean, that would make sense. So that might, that might change up for next year as well. Okay, but that but, will, we'll try yeah. to update that and put that in the handbook that we send out in August. Hmm. And um, now for the parents that are picking up their children from the school bus, it has to be somebody picking up that you designated on the transportation form that you signed, that you gave us during registration. Our uh, monitors, our school bus monitors will not release the child unless they know who they're giving this child to. Also during registration on the transportation form, you told me where you wanted your child picked up and where you wanted the child dropped off. Um, either the end of this week or the beginning of next week, I am gonna be handing in those transportation forms to the transportation department so that they could start making their bus routes. If anything has changed since registration, please email me and I will update it. Um, yeah, please email me if there's any changes with the transportation at all. For, for child pickup, uh, ID is necessary as well to sign them out. Correct, I forgot that one, you're right. You, the person picking up the child has to have some type of ID. Um, go ahead, next slide. And I'm gonna to try to read some of these questions while you're doing the next slide. And that would be our teachers. 
Go yeah. ahead, guys. Yeah, I was going to say. All right. So this is our curriculum. Um, so teaching strategies gold consists of the children's learning being divided up into interest areas of blocks, dramatic play, art, sand and water, cooking, outdoors, toys and games, music and movement, discovery and computers and library. And this year, um, that was just completely different <laughs> because of the uh, COVID restrictions and everything else. Um, so next year, it, it will probably be more back to that, you know, uh, strategy of uh, center-based play and all of that, <laughs> all of that. But uh, yeah, that's that's the main teaching strategies there. Uh, the day consists of numerous activities designed with purposeful play. Um, each activity has a purpose. So it's not just, you know, what, when children are playing, it's not, they're just not playing for the sake of playing. There is some purpose and meaning behind the play. Um, activities include centers, individual instruction, small group instruction, and large group instruction. And next slide. So math, math, uh, pre-kindergarten mathematics is about developing the understanding of whole numbers using concrete materials, including concepts of correspondence, counting, cardinality, and comparison. Um, and also describing shapes in their environment. So some of the standards um, are counting to five, shapes counting to 10, uh, comparison of length, weight, capacity, numbers two, five, and addition and subtraction stories and counting to 20. Um, the curriculum we use is the Engage uh, New York uh, curriculum for pre-K. And that's basically just kind of the uh, state created curriculum that you would see if you have older children as well. Um, it's used throughout um, different grades all over the place. So it's not, it's, it's a curriculum that is built, you know, not just, I mean, it's built just for pre-K, but it's kind of built along with other grades as well. So it feeds into a much bigger thing, it, you know, so the skills and concepts they learn this, that they will learn this year will also be, you know, fed into when they go up to kindergarten. So it's not just that they're going to learn it this year and then that's it. They learn it and then it builds up scaffolds over time. Uh, next slide. Okay, let her see. Actually, can I just see the next slide after that for one sec? Because I wasn't sure what that looked like. Okay, go back. <laughs> I want to see if something was on there. All right, so uh, foundations. Um, so uh, word study. So uh, foundations, it provides an introduction to letter sound and writing skills uh, that will be taught to mastery in the foundation level K program. Um, and again, that's a program that it's in the district. It's, you know, it's scaffolded over time. So what they learn in pre-K is reinforcing and kind of building up a knowledge that they'll have for kindergarten. Um, so alphabetic principles and letter sound associations, alphabetical order and written language skill of manuscript letter format, uh, formation. So um, they learn their letter sounds through an alphabet chant and other activities. And they also learn how to write. Um, the beginning of the year, the beginning of the year, they mainly focus on kind of just the letter formation. And then um, over the course of time, they, um, they get to write the letters um, more so in the second half of the year, they actually get to write the letters themselves. Um, the beginning of the year, they focus more on what's called sky writing. So they'll kind of just use their finger to write in the sky. And we also have a writing grid that they use to kind of just establish how, you know, how high they, and how, how high and how low they need to make their letters. So we kind of really reinforce that uh, letter formation throughout the year. And then Fontes and Pennell resources. Um, I think that goes on to the next one. Laser, go, there we go. Oh, you're, you're good? <laughs> Um, so, uh, so this goes with Fontes and Pinnell. So Fontes and Pinnell is broken into, uh, shared reading, um, shared reading slash literacy centers and interactive read alouds. So shared reading is basically children and teachers read aloud a book, uh, 
read a book aloud. Uh, it's usually a very big book. Um, this year was done a little bit differently. We did it through a kind of a presentation. Um, I hope you don't hear a child crying in the background. <laughs> That's my child. I'm not sure how loud that is. But well, um, don't worry about it. You might, my son's getting ready to come in the house because I'm cooking. That's why I catch that. Okay, so it is what it is. My... It's the beauty of Zoom. <laughs> so we have, um, so in normal years, we have a big book. It's a really big book. It has enlarged version, enlarged, um, enlarged text that basically when you were doing the shared readings, it, it emphasizes on the wording in the books. Um, so with that, you get early experiences with print. Um, it promotes the reading process. A lot of the books are very kind of sing-songy and rhyming and they kind of you know, it, when we keep reading them over and over again, eventually the children kind of start to remember what is being said in the book. And that's kind of, you know, the, the beginnings of literacy. So um, let me just have you to yeah. hold on. Ms. Randolphy did let the parents know. Take it, we're taking it back. What's happening is, is that rhyming text is just like when a child hears a song i don't care if it's a rap song if it's a song song maybe your favorite music in the house and they can recite every word right parents okay or pieces of it well that's what rhyming text does it trains the brain to hear certain sounds so it allows them things that rhyme it allows them to if you're looking at a text and you know cat hat, ball, rat. So now we have that rhyming text. It trains that brain to hear the certain sounds. It's repetitive. At the young age, we're developing their short-term as well as their long-term memory, training that brain to hear certain sounds. That's why there's a lot of repetitiveness. Uh, I, th I think we lost it for a sec on we lost on again. Yeah, but she's she's there. We just can't hear. But a lot of rhyming words. That's why little people can sit there and they could just go. And parents are like, "Wait a minute! Oh, they 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 know the words. Uh, yeah, they know the words because they keep hearing it. The brain. So a lot of the things that you do, like the Mother Goose books, a lot of those things, all of that's coming back. Cat in a Hat. It is phenomenal in teaching the children to train their brains to hear certain sounds to support their literacy. When they're, when they're trying to sound out a word, that's when it kick in. When they're trying to spell a word, some letters in a word are silent letters. And we teach them, you just gotta know that this is a silent letter, but you train that brain, brain to hear certain sounds. So that's what, when um, Mr. Pendolfi is talking, that's what the text and the print and all of that do for, for the children. So I just wanna, share that um, perfect <laughs> um absolutely perfect um and then interactive read alouds um interactive read alouds are more the classic type of books that you would read to your child at night um they're read around they're read aloud daily that expand the students thinking and spark discussion and inquiry so those are the books that we would read with the children but you know we'll have more discussions about it and may, maybe we'll ask some questions about maybe what, what, what will happen next or you know, you kind of get into the comprehension end of it. So it's not just, you know, it, while the shared reads are more of trying to get those letter sounds and trying to get, trying to build, build that up, uh, that end of it up a little bit. The interactive read alouds are more about trying to make your children think and trying to kind of, you know, predict the text a little bit. So. And I want to go back and share. I want to go back and share with the families. When your child has to take the state exams, okay, um, in the state exams, when they have to write, um, they're given a passage, and then they're given a series of questions to write out what, 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 is, what who's your favorite character? Why is this? Da, da, da. There's a beginning, middle, and the end. That's what we're teaching them at a young age, but they don't even know it. So when they're doing the reader aloud and they're expand, we're expanding their vocabulary and we're increasing their ability to think, it increases their ability to talk, to write. So as they move up in their educational journey in their upper grades, 
we laid the foundation for building that creative way of thinking, that creative way of speaking, and that creative way of writing. That, that's what it's about. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's the end of that slide. And then also, um, just uh, before, um, because we have uh, Hegarty uh, Phonemic Awareness as well, which is a new program that we've installed this year, which um, basically just kind of builds up those, um, kind of builds up the beginnings of letter sounds. It, more, it kind of coincides with foundations, but we start getting into individual, we break up words into individual letter sounds. So let's, let's say cat, um, we break it up into C, uh, k, at. So we break up the individual words into letters. We do rhyming words. Um, that's the best way I can explain it off, off the top of my head. But no, um, you did very well because what it does when you have rhyming text, all of that builds that mental comprehension. And right. Haggerty is a resource, and it's a resource that further helps us. Children, all of our children, we all have our superpowers. The children learn and think differently in different ways. And Haggerty gives us that platform, that resource platform to help spark their creative thinking, their creative way of understanding words and text and understanding the story. So that's what Haggerty does. It helps to break down that letter, the words and their sounds so that the children act. You know, um, I still find myself using this stuff, but you know, when you're trying to spell out a word and you, you, you can, if you say at, and you, and eventually they can say C-A-T because it's cat. So that's what it does. It just trains the brain to hear those sounds. And it's just a smaller minute resource to help push that piece through their thought process. Okay, so we're on science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, STEAM, we incorporate STEAM through every aspect of what it is we do. STEAM through math, um, we have a lot of, we have a few gadgets in the classroom. Um, and the children, the teachers are very creative. Uh, you know, we didn't, I didn't have online when I went, I was teaching. So you have, um, you have the engineering piece, plugging things together. As you can see the children down there, So she was talking about the bottom picture for the engineering piece. Um, with that program that we have there, the students are building. Um, Ms. Woodbury, you can see, would you like to add to that? Yes, your sound went out. So I was just trying to fill in the gap. <laughs> I'm sorry. So with the program at the bottom that the children are using, it's um, they're building using the blueprint. So that's a part of engineering that they can use in the classroom. And each class has that, um, that game there. And as Mrs. Mill was saying, we do use STEAM throughout every lesson that we have. And even in the areas that we have in the classroom, we have a discovery area where the students can use, you can see in the picture, they have hatch pads, they can use the computers in the classroom. So we try to incorporate STEAM into everything that we do. You can go to the next slide. Second step is a program that we use to help our students with their social and emotional learning. Um, the program follows, the children learn self-discipline and behaviors that will result in cooperation, sharing, following directions, listening and showing respect for themselves and others. So second step has five major units. The first one is skills for learning, where the students learn, they learn listening rules and they learn how to focus their attention. They also learn self-talk. So when we give them directions, to help them remember the directions, they'll say it to themselves and then they'll know what to do. The second unit is empathy. This whole unit is about feelings. The students learn how to maintain their feelings, how to control their feelings. They learn different breathing techniques to help them control their feelings. The next one is emotion management. Um, so it basically helps the students to answer the question, what, do you, what to do when you have strong feeling? Um, there are songs that go along with second step for the children to remember the different steps for the different rules and for the different breathing techniques that we have them do. Um, the next one is friendship skills and problem solving. 
And finally, it is transitioning to kindergarten. You can go to the next slide. So our IB learner profiles are also incorporated throughout our lessons. Um, we have different IB learning, learning profiles for different months. So it goes, it starts with caring, then communicators, inquirers, thinkers, reflective, open-minded, risk takers, knowledgeable, principal, and well-balanced. So throughout all of our lessons, we try to incorporate each IB learner profile just to help the students for when they get to the older grades, because I know we do have our IB graduation that they have in high school and throughout the whole school district, it's district wide, they use the IB learner profiles. Since we are housed in um, Highview this school year, we can hear the Highview students saying they're, um, they have like this morning chant that they say for each IB learner profile to help them to understand what it means to be caring or what it means to be a communicator. And it's great that our students also hear it because they're also learning the same thing at the same time. You can go to the next slide, please. So our assessments, we assess the students three times throughout the year for their benchmark assessments. The first assessment is done when they first come in. So we basically have a baseline of all the information that they know, and we can see their progress throughout the school year. And we also perform the dial assessment. With this assessment, we have fine motor and gross motor. Um, there's concepts and also a language portion to that assessment. And this is done twice a year, in the beginning of the year and also at the end of the school year. And throughout the whole entire school year, we are assessing the children um, informally and formally to make sure that they are understanding the different lessons that we do daily, especially with math. There's, also a, there's always a component for us to um, assess the students just to make sure that they're retaining the information. And being that our math lessons are consecutive, it helps us to make sure they're um, retaining the information and it helps them going on to the next lesson. I just want to share, I just want to share this with that. Um, the children with the benchmark, it also is a, it, it, it's also a um, checkpoint for the teacher. Okay. The teacher know there's three different levels of learners. They know if this child, if I'm teaching it this way, is this child getting it? And they can tell because as they're going along, they're, they're doing small assessments with the children. They do one-on-one, -on -one, they do group to find out what it is. Is your child retaining this information? And if they're not retaining this information, how do I build in my professional toolbox the creativity and things that I need to do as a teacher and educator, because we're the ones with the master degrees to make sure that this child get what they need. So it's also a checkpoint for us as teachers and educators. I, I, I wanna make sure that's out there with that. So it gives us our checkpoints too, and it helps us to back up and say, let me not go forward, okay, with this lesson with this group of children, um, because I know I got small groundwork to clear up and do, to help build those skills. So that's pretty much what it is that we do in that retrospect. So I, 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 I wanna put that there. Mm -hmm. Next, Mr. Leder, Mr. Alert. Okay, so um, <laughs> the students are offered um, breakfast and lunch daily. Um, it is free for all of the children. They have daily snacks this school year. Um, each child brought their own snack to school. I know last year we had, well, in my classroom, we had parents who would bring oh. snacks, would bring <clears throat> snacks for the class and we would house them in the school. And every time it was snack, the, the parents didn't have to one, they didn't have to make sure that they brought a snack for their child because we had it readily available for them. Um, it's something that is shared too. Like the teachers usually have a calendar. Like um, I'm going to get Megan Zinger here. Hi, Megan. How are you, honey? Um, like say for instance, um, week. Okay, um, th this this week uh, is the second week. It's going to be um, Mrs. Zinger's turn to send in snack, and we have 18 kids, mm -hmm. so she's going to send in snack for 18 kids. And then next week we'll put. So the teachers will have. It where it's not on one parent, but it's a shared thing where all parents and sometimes they'll say, okay, hold back. 
Oh, we have some parents that they will snack you out. I mean, um, they will go and get those nice little veggie, those little nice veggie pea things. The kids love them. Um, and they'll say, no, you know what? Um, you know, we're okay. You know, do you mind if we, we, we do it again this week? You know, we want to, and it's fine. So the teachers will then tell the other parents, okay, hold back. You know, we have enough snacks for right now. So this is what we do. And then when we need, the teachers will reach out to our families to say, okay, it's your turn. Okay, yes, because Mrs. Zinger really got busy with these snacks this month. So it's the next person's turn, next family's turn. So these are the things I know, Megan, I got you, right? <laughs> um, mwah, mwah. But, you know, but this is what we do. The teachers will have a schedule and they will you will know what's going on, families. Um, you'll know when it's your turn. And, um, and you'll be told what type of healthy snacks to send. We're not going down with the chocolate chip cookies and the Vienna fingers. And we're not having the fruit punch uh, juice boxes. Uh, no. Uh, it has to be 100% juice. It has to, everything is regulated by the state of New York and what is considered healthy snacks. Am I still here? Yes, you are. Yeah. I'm yes. No, you know what it is? I just pushed the button. I'm not that tech savvy. You know, COVID really taught me to be a little savvy, but I just hit some button and I don't know what happened. I thought I was gone. But yeah, so you'll be given a list of what the hell, just an example of the healthy snacks. And you're going to say, wow, this is right on point with me. The children, so we work with our families with that piece. And we'll, the teachers will let you know allergies. We know what we can have and what we can't. We know that we're peanut free. Okay, nut free. We want no nuts. No nuts. We, we don't like nuts. You can't even send a peanut butter and jelly. People say almond butter. That, that's a nut too. You can't even send that nut because we have some children at a very young age. They don't even know. Some children don't even know that they have a nut allergy. This is what's crazy about our little people. Um, the par parents know that your child has this allergy. Then they say, I never knew my child had this allergy, you know, the strawberries or the nuts. Nut allergy is a huge, huge thing. And a child could be eating two tables down. They could be eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. This is what happened to me when I was the principal at Lee of Jackson. A child was at another table eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then when they finished, they, they were talking to their friend. Hold up. They ate the peanut butter sandwich. It was in their mouth. Mm -hmm. Rinse it down. But the fact, I learned something, the fact that this child still had the peanut oil in their mouth. We know oil doesn't go away that fast. So the little friend was like, you're my best friend. I'll never forget it. And the two girls, you know, they're like hugging and caring. Just being in that close proximity, that well, my face swelled up. I said, what happened? Coming up, coming in there, and it was just a simple fact. The child didn't have it, did it, but the fact that that child hugged that other child, and that their friends, and that child ate the peanut butter and jelly, so we shut down. Um, no nuts. No nuts. You can't even have a nut across the table. No nuts. So we're, we're nut free. <clears throat> so that's, we'll give you a, what's allowed for snack. Um, and any allergies, did you let the, the nurse, nurse Crystal know um, what your child's allergies are. And we will, the teachers will have them in the classroom. And trust me when I tell you, the teachers are sharpshooters. They know what this, and oh, some of the children will tell you too. They can't have 2% um, milk. So we have some parents who would have to provide their soy because food service is not gonna provide their soy. So you might have to provide their soy or their, their uh, milk or whatever it is. I live on a farm, so I got two goats, there's four goats on this other side. So people have goat milk. So you, you would have to provide whatever fluid if we, if we can't get um, Airmark to provide it, you would have to provide it so your child can have it in support of your child's um, allergies in, in terms of that retrospect. Mr. Alert, next. Ms. Mel, Mel there's a question. There's a question. Um, Mr. Laser. Okay. Huh? Can okay, you hear me? Can we hear us? Are we waiting okay. on Mr. Alert? I there's a you. Okay, there's a question. Are students allowed to bring their own lunch or do they have to have eat the school lunch? Um, unless there's a doctor's or medical reason to for them not to eat our lunch, you would have to have a doctor's note. But other than that, as of now, it's school lunch. 
It's okay. Keep going. Yes. When it comes to the food, what happens is this. If you tell us that your child has an allergy to this or that, if we, if we cannot accommodate it through Aramark food service, then yes, we will say to you, you know what, mom, dad, we need you to provide your child's lunch um, because we cannot provide it for you, for your child. So we will then reach out and do it that way. Um, if you get a doctor's order, a note stating that, um, the, that your child uh, is best nutritiously fed and through your food or whatever the case may be, they have to have it. Well, then we have to honor what the doctor said. But we've had situations and it's fine. Um, but we, we have some where the parents say, oh, the child, my child will eat nobody else's food but mine. <laughs> and at the end of the day, um, you know, we're not going to have no child to starve. Um, the human body didn't program itself to starve. So no, we will, we will make sure that we work with our families individually to say what is best for your child, what can we do that is best for your child nutritiously, and we will work together as a team with that. That's on a, a case by case basis. I think I put it there correct, right? Yeah. Um, are there any other questions in the chat? So oh, somebody asked, said, what is, this, what is the setup for, set up for nap time? I saw something for about setup for nap time. <laughs> we no longer call it nap time. The state doesn't call it nap time anymore. Um, we call it, it's called quiet time. Why? Quiet time is still an educational time. See, now, if we have it set on a calendar, nap time, okay, everybody get on the cots and, and we used to have it, that's not counted as, that's not counted as instructional time. But if it's quiet time where developmentally at this very young age, my body needs to wind down, my body needs to catch up to itself. So I need to take, uh, you know, so it's called quiet time. Now, during quiet time, the teachers will have, um, and the children are awake. If they want a book, I've been in classrooms, they whisper, they have, Mrs. Melvin, can I get another book? And I say, yes. I was in Mrs. Woodbury's class, Miss Woodbury's class night, it happened. And then a child finished that book, they want a couple more books. I just handed them a handful of books <laughs> and ran out of the classroom. But you know, they have some classrooms, they have iPads where the kids can do a quiet activity. Um, it's quiet time. Some children will need that quiet time, some children, they don't, but everybody gets quiet time, but it's still time where you can have quiet instruction. You can have quiet time where maybe you're doing, uh, you could then take a child and maybe do a, a story and maybe talk about beginning, middle, end of the story or whatever the case may be. So we have quiet time. It's no longer nap time. So what we do is we ask the parents, the children will sit at, their t at the table and they can put their head down. So parents send a little pillow and they can put their little head down on their pillow and it's quiet time. Usually they're sitting there whispering at their friend that's across the table. And now that we have COVID, you know, they still, kids will find a way to sit at their table and what are you doing? Hi. You know, so they have conversations with the other child. But as long as they're, they're, it's quiet time and they're giving that time for their body, that's what we do. We don't do nap time anymore. The state told us that. Parent involvement. Who wants to do parent involvement? I, I can do parent involvement, class participation. We always look to have class parents, right? Ms. Woodbury, Mr. Pandolfi, we want some class parents. We want you to be, a, and you could be a working class parent. We've had parents that come in between their lunch, if they're working locally, to come in and, and maybe drop in and do a story. You don't even have to be a class parent to do a story. You could say, you know what, Ms. Woodbury, or Mr. Pendolfi, or Ms. Ludina, I want to come and read once a month to the class. Um, and you can schedule a book once a month and you work with the teacher. So there's many ways you can participate in the classroom um, with the children. And the children get to know who you are. Because as soon as you come in, they'll tell everybody in the classroom whose mommy you are. So. Um, <laughs> so you will have no identity. You will become, um, Amy's mother or Amy's father or John's father and mother, you know, back to school night. 
um, when we have our back to school night, we have back to school night where the teachers talk about just an overview of what's going to go on for the school year and what are our expectations for the school year. So back to school night is not a parent, it's not a parent, um, PT, a parent um, teacher conference, it's where you gather information um, on what the curriculum is going to be, what are the expectations, and that's how we run our back to school night. Um, there is a uh, ECP Lee of Jackson, the book club, family fun night. Oh, we have awesome activities where we have one book and the parents will read the book. And then we have an activity from that book where you engage with your child at a table with other families and their children. And you create an activity based upon the story of the book. We do have a male initiative program. We haven't had our male initiative program in um, a couple of years. <laughs> because of uh, everything happening. Um, so the male initiative program is basically the life and role of a male in the life of a child. What we always do is we connect everything to the curriculum. Um, we might use an IB profile. What does it mean to be caring? Where the children will be doing, um, there's a story read and then there's activities, there's hands-on act activities. Whether it's the grandfather, brother, uncle, cousin, um, dad, whomever. Um, and trust me when I tell you, I've never seen so many grown men sit down and do activities and enjoy themselves with the children gluing and feathers everywhere. And they made turkeys um, one year for Thanksgiving. The children made their own turkeys and the fathers were sitting there making their turkeys. And I'm sitting there looking at this. They did something for Mother's Day. It was hilarious. And it was amazing to see the connection between the, the male, whoever was there, whether it was dad, uncle, brother, to see them talking to the child and whispering. And they said, no, I want mine like this. I don't want mine to look like yours. So the children will give you their opinion, but we have that piece there and it focuses on literacy and the arts. We have family math night where you get to learn, the teachers teach you. Math is not done the way we used to do math back in the days, families. So you'll learn how we teach your child to use manipulatives, how to, how to calculate out a, a math problem. Um, so we we will work with you on that literacy development workshop. We work with our families. We have workshops on the Fontes and Pinnell where we teach the we teach the families what we actually do hands-on with the stories, what we actually what actually takes place. So you have an active role in knowing what it is that you can do as a parent, even though I'm a working parent, I'm doing XYZ, I'm da da da. I know what my child's curriculum is, and I feel confident that I can support my child with their curriculum. Um, we used to do a district-wide science extravaganza, which was absolutely phenomenal. That was from pre-K to, to Woodlands, I mean, uh, to high school, and the different classrooms of different activities. Um, I'm not sure what that's going to look like for next year, um, or if we're going to have it, but it's something that has been phenomenal um i would say for the past um five six years so um there are many oh we also parent involvement we also have international uh dessert night so there's a lot of cultural things because we are a cultural melting pot there's a lot of things that we do to work with our families for our children to get to see different households different cultures and different ways that families are formed. Um, and that's teaching them about the world outside your, your home, your doors. So that's what we expose the children to. Um, we use, utilize the Greenberg Nature Center. We do a lot, we do a lot of community-based um, trips, going to the supermarket, um, counting out apples, doing different things. And all of this is a part of your child's um, learning and development. And, and the whole piece of this is what we do to keep you involved with them. Mr. Laser, next. Who told you to say my name? Are there any more questions in the chat that I can get to? Now you see this picture here, families? You see those, those big, big boy, big girl backpacks on their back? The children. The children, we have folders that we put, we, we transport back and forth 
um, they, they're a mail carrier. So if we want to send something home to you, paper form or whatever, they will have a folder in their backpack. Um, any work that they do in the classroom, they take their work, the teachers tell them, put your work in your backpack so you can share it with, um, share it at home. Um, so I've, we've seen where parents have sent the cute little backpacks. And trust me, we don't put anything more in there than the papers or anything. So it's not like their back is weighing down like when they get in the upper grades and they have textbooks, but now they have computers and stuff. So you're weighing their back down, no. But their change of clothes, if they soil the clothes, we should always have a change of clothes. And we always ask the parents to make sure those change of clothes are seasonal. So we don't, like right now it's warm. So the teachers are letting the parents know you know, those sweatpants that we got in here and that, that long fleece sweatshirt that they got inside over here needs to go home and so that they can have a shorter sleeve shirt and shorts or whatever so they, they're comfortable. Um, so that this way, because children play, children, children have accidents and it happened. We have had some of our best children that the parents says, oh my God, they so-and-so never has an accident. Yeah, well, if so-and-so is playing with their friends over there, and they're having a good time playing and you see them bouncing around with their hand down there and they try, and you said, do you have to go to the bathroom? No. And they do have to go to the bathroom, but they don't want to tell us that they have to go to the bathroom. So what happens? They have an accident. So we should have a change of clothes and then we'll send the soiled clothes home. The teachers will um, email you. This is why it's very important that your email addresses and your your phone numbers, cell phones, however we can get in touch with you. When we have phone blasts, um, it could go to your cell phone. It doesn't have to go to your home phone. Um, so there's many ways that we're gonna communicate with you, but we need you to keep us up to date with your information. It's very, very critical um, because believe it or not, we've had families in the past where numbers have changed and they've been busy in their lives of work and we don't get the change of the number and what happens we can't get in touch with you for an emergency situation so we just ask that whatever whenever there's a change please keep us a part of it please label all your children's clothing we've said children have left that in trust me i tell you y'all don't realize you could probably go and the child say that's mine and something a jacket will go home with um amy and, and that's not Amy's jacket. So Amy's mommy's calling Ms. Woodbury said, this is Amy's jacket. So we said that back. But if you make sure that you um, label your children's clothing, um, this way we can make sure that your child's stuff, because the children dress themselves. So we don't want them digging, um, digging in somebody else's stuff. And children, their friends, no, it's okay. You can wear my shirt. No, you can. Next, you know, you got uh, Amy over here wearing Jane's shirt and going home with it. And we thinking that that's Jane's shirt, Amy's shirt, but it's Jane's shirt. And the next, you know, she go home and I was like, well, whose shirt you got on? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't want you to think that as, as so much as us, but we, we want you to help us because those little people, they have PhDs in friendship. And they will share their stuff. <laughs> Next. <laughs> it is so true. Right, Ms. Whitbear? Okay. Are there any more questions or concerns? Anything that you put in the chat that we can, I can answer. And if I can't answer, maybe one of my teachers can answer. Or maybe our nurse, uh, Crystal, can answer. Or maybe Deb um, can answer. I want to make sure. Now, if not, trust me when I tell you, go to the website. You know you have our email address. Please email us. And trust me, we'll answer your questions. We will answer your questions. Are there any more questions in the chat that I need to? Did we get to all of them? Let me see. So far, we have none waiting. OK. So there goes that, one. That one. There goes one. Oh, oh, oh. Will we get a summer supply list? Oh. Will we get a school supply list? Uh, we don't do supply school supply lists. We're gonna save that for when your kids get older and the and the schools, the teachers are asking for four boxes of red pens or something like that. But we don't do <laughs> even facial tissue. We don't do supply lists. And 
I mean, I understand that you might have a family member or someone that say, no, my child's pre, pre, pre-K school, they ask for, they have a supply list. Well, you could smile and say, you know, my tax dollars are working for me because we don't have a supply list. <laughs> Just a if book the bag teacher, and a folder. Oh, well, <laughs> if not, we supply... I mean, even, not, even, if, not even the folder. We supply the folder. Not even the folder. We supply the folder too. <laughs> Just the backpack, a regular size backpack that fits a folder in there. And you have to make sure that your child is wearing closed toed shoes and a rubber bottom. Um, and even if they have on sandals, like one of the parents says, the teacher said um, the child came in with sandals, and it's the nice sandals with the leather ones where the toes are closed. But you know how it has the little gaps in them for the air out their little feet? Okay. What happens when wood chips get in? Ah, Miss Woodbury, I got, I got wood chips in my shoe. They have to have sneakers or a closed, a closed shoe because they get the wood chips in there and they don't like it. So I just want parents to know, I, you know, you want them to look cute and trust it and handsome. Trust me, they look cute and handsome, but don't let no wood chips get in there because they do go outside. With that said, I want to thank each and every single. Oh, hold up! How much time do they spend outdoors each day, Ms. Woodbury, Mr. Indolfi? Why don't you tell them your experience of what they spend outside? So usually, I like for my children to go out at least twenty to thirty minutes a day, especially if it's a very nice day outside. Um, they need the fresh air. They need the space to run around. So we give them a good amount of time to go outside. I would and say it's ra- around the same time for me. Uh, I, I like to encourage to go outside. So, I mean, unless it's extremely cold or unless it's extremely hot and rainy, I, I try to I try to push the outdoor play as much as I can. So, well, what's nice about outdoor play is not just that they're outdoor playing. There's other activities, educational activities that the teachers will do outside. Um, in the past, I've seen shape hunts, letter hunts, where they probably go out there and plant index cards in, in different places, and the kids got to find them and tell them what they found. So there's a lot of, we, we use outdoor as the as a, an extension of our classrooms. It's, an out, it's a part of our classrooms. So yes, they're playing, but they're playing with a purpose. I want that to be known. Are there any more questions? If not, please do not hesitate to send us any of your questions. You can email me. Um, we will get back to you. Um, we want to thank you for coming. You can read this. I don't think you need us to do it. Hold up. How many ECP classes are going to be in Lee of Jackson this fall? How big is the class size? Oh, I love you guys. Well, right now we have five classrooms at Lee of Jackson. And Lee of Jackson needs their space back. I know we're crunching them. But we have five classrooms there. And... Um, the class size will not exceed 18 students. And that's with mandated by the state of New York at the pre-K level, you have a teacher and a teaching assistant, at least two adults inside that classroom. And that's with 18 students on the average. And I say that because we have some class um, special uh, class classrooms, which require a different adult to student ratio. Um, so that's different, but on the average, 18 students, 18 students. So if we don't have any more questions, I want to thank our families first, um, for your participation in this new parent, um, orientation. I want to thank, um, my faculty, my teachers, Ms. Woodbury, Mr. Pendolfi for your time, um, and participating and sharing with the families. Um, I want to thank uh, our nurse, Nurse Crystal. I want to thank um, Debbie Dion's. I want to thank Mr. Laser Alert, the man behind the scenes from tech, who's, who made this possible for us with the PowerPoint presentation. I want to thank each and every one of you. Please stay so healthy, safe. Um, your families I wish you all the blessings and best and look forward to September. But we're going to have some interaction before September. So... Just stay posted. You keep your emails open. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.